for being here tonight. Thank you, Joy. I'm a chair professor at Urban College of Boston. I'm a former professor at Urban College of Just recently. Yeah, just recently. <laughs> of legal studies, criminal justice. I am from Philadelphia, but I came here for undergrad and law school. And you've lived in this community area for two years, two and a half years. But and you work in, uh, were part of the Cambridge newspaper as well? I was, okay, so let's backtrack a little bit. <laughs> um, if, I didn't exclusively come here. The first time I came here, uh, I came here fresh out of the military in my 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and I was an editorial assistant for the Cambridge Chronicle, the Watertown Press, and the Somerville Journal when they were all on Elm Street. Right. And then when I got my first degree from Urban College of Boston, I moved to the South. And I was a crime writer. Um, then I progressed to being um, a, a city government writer. I covered this. Uh, the city council for the city of Charlotte is a reporter for the uh, independent Republican newspaper. I could say Republican. <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. and then I was a layout editor in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And I moved back here in 2006 and went to Bay Path College, graduated, and then I graduated from law school last June. Oh, nice. Wow. Okay. So, so you have, like, you've been here, you left, and you came back? Yeah, I left. And then right when I was out, you told me back in. Right. Yeah. Well, we're always happy to be here. Um, so that's a start in, of you in you know telling us about yourself. Um, do you wanna? Is there anything that's like really um, uh, singular that you sticks out for you that you maybe would want to start a conversation on? It could be here, uh, or. The conversation about race and racism. It could be the race and racism piece because I think that was the focal point. That was mm -hmm. the purpose of us being here, convening here. So I guess I was supposed to be from a legal perspective. And I think when we were talking, when we had such a great conversation, something that stuck out to me that hasn't been a part of the conversation, in a bigger conversation, is Sandra Bland. Sandra Bland and women in any of the movements, in any of, um, when we talk about race and racism, the absence and silencing women of women in any of the movements, um, you know, that this is not unusual for, in the Black Lives Matter movement, for um, women's role to be minimalized, or uh, either, either invisible, minimalized, you would think that we don't uh, suffer police brutality. This is not a singular or individualized to Black Lives Matter. It's happened with the Black Panther Party. It happened with the Civil Rights Movement. It happened with the abolitionists. So this is a traditional silencing. It's historical. So it falls right in line with, and it's disappointing because Michelle Alexander, although I admire her work, she says that she recognizes that, but she hopes that someone else will take, pick up the call, pick up the reins from where she's at. So, you know, Sandra Bland is just one woman of, amongst many that um, have fallen through the cracks. Yeah. And we tend to make uh, black men the faces of this cause. And that's damaging uh, for us because uh, I don't think, if our experiences aren't shared and people aren't on the, you know, they're not doing a neighborhood watch, so to speak, for, us who's looking out for us so I'm, I'm often concerned about wh wh whose lives really matter are we really saying black lives matter or are we saying black men's lives matter well you know just as you said this i'm just thinking of this week and the um uh clarence thomas um uh, anita hill anita hill, hill. Mm -hmm. and how she was always so articulate and she was very clear and she was the ideal person to be speaking, and yet she still was the person who was diminished. She was absolutely vilified. I mean, I was 21 at the time, and I probably was one of those people who was, I just remember being particularly mean, because I was following the wave. So I was maybe 20, or no, maybe 2019, I remember saying, oh, I don't believe her. She's trying to bring a black man down. That, you know, that thing, and <clears throat> now I'm, 
not far from 26. And, um, <laughs> and uh, in retrospect, I, um, you know, I look at, uh, you know, she's a professor of law, she went to law school. Isn't it interesting how our perspectives change as we get older? As we get older, yeah. our perspectives change, our lives change. And I now I look at her and I go, oh my God, yeah. our lives could be the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I have worked in situations where I've been particularly uncomfortable and then you realize that she never came forward and said this is what he did to me. This is something she was called upon to say. And then she kind of like slipped into the woodwork and it was kind of like, where it happened to Anita? Where did Anita Hill go? She's yeah. been right here at Brandeis the whole time. Yeah. And none of us even, she was right under our noses this whole time. So it's another example of silencing in the movement. She was a black woman who spoke out and it was, and I read something recently in the New York Times where it was kind of assessed as, you know, let's pick one or the other. We're gonna pick either race or gender and we decided to pick, it's gonna be a race thing, not a gender thing, when it, the two were actually intermingled. Mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of like, which, which dog do we wanna fight? It was saying down south, you know, do you have a dog in this fight? And I think the dog we wanted in that fight was just, it's just easier to say trying to hold the black man down. Never mind that this black woman had experienced these horrible things, right. so. I, I, I don't know if, if everyone sees it, but it feels like it's just so plain to see that how she was treated so horribly and if she had the panel of senators uh, at the table and they were asking her ridiculous questions that you wouldn't ask a man. No, you wouldn't ask a man that, um, but I think um, under that particular administration, um, it was, um, he was a nice fit. He was a nice, uh, let's get a person of color in there, but let's not get someone who's too radical. Let's just face, face it, he's known now as like the, the silent judge on any opinions. He never right. says anything. He's, he's the most conservative judge we've ever had. He never says it. He never has an yeah. opinion. But he his never, voting record is, he's the most conservative. He's amazing. He's very he's conservative. He never, um, I think he's worse than Anton Scalia, yeah, personally. No, he's very he doesn't question, um, he doesn't question, but I think he was, um, at the risk of being provocative, I think he was an example of black facing. Let's just put this black at all, at all means necessary. You know, he was better than a liberal white, which, you know, he was better than, you know, he was saying all the right words. I don't like affirmative action. I don't, you know, and, you know, and then, you know, the double it, he, he was, he was, you know, sworn with his, Really white wife, and we just let him get away with it. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with having a really white wife, I would like to say. Have a really white wife. It's just, I love the lilies. Okay. <laughs> well, it's interesting because we read two books by women, and we read Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, Between the World and Me, and all of them were so different. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think it was great reading the ta Coates book first because it was well written. Um, I mean, he's very articulate and he's very clear. Um, and he brought up a lot of good points that I think people don't necessarily think about all the time. And I thought that was really good. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> Jacqueline Woodson was more of a memoir and I mean that was about her her life is specifically I mean she's a, a children's author but growing up in the south and mm -hmm. sort of then growing up in New York City um, and I think what sparked a lot of conversation afterwards was when she received the the uh, Caldecott or not Caldecott yeah. the Newbery it was, Award well, it was the Newbery. one of the Newbery the awards and when she was being given the award a good friend of hers commented and handing her the award that um, that her bet, you know, who would have known that she'd be allergic to watermelon. And it was like in the presentation of the award, mm -hmm. so it really changed the, the, the tone of the award. Mm -hmm. And when we were reading the book, people said she didn't sound like she, she was angry enough. Like we wanted her to be angry enough. And subsequently we read a New York Times piece that she wrote that did articulate this anger, and it was really great because we could see, like, 
she's a children's author, so she presents things in a way that are appropriate for children. Mm -hmm. But but also, I think she she also presents things in a way. She doesn't sugarcoat them. She just talked about her life growing up and how the women would go to church meetings where they would talk with um, the uh, prepared to go to marches and things like that. And they make food and what her experience was as a young child. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Michelle Alexander is sort of brings it more to a current place and you think of the criminal justice system mm -hmm. in a very different way. You know, so each book was really different. Mm -hmm. um, and you being a professor, I, I mean, the, the new Jim Crow was, was, was hard to read. It's very, um, you, you can read it and take breaks. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's a very academic. Piece. I didn't find it to be a difficult read, <clears throat> and I, I don't. I think my. I depend upon your perspective. I think that she was kind of doing a battle cry that people of color we already know. Right. Like you don't have to tell us that the prisons are black, packed with black folk. Right. Because I don't know a black person personally that doesn't have a family member in jail or that hasn't come to prison. So I don't think that the idea of the prison industrial complex is something that is so foreign to uh, African Americans or persons of color. So that I would include Latinos, um, myriad of groups in that. Um, but I do think it's an eye opener for those individuals who are not aware of the prison industrial com complex or the military industrial complex. So. I think that it's an eye opener, and works like that are important <clears throat> because for me, you know, it's almost like preaching to the fire. I mean, I I would be expected to have read it, and my colleagues would expect to have read it, but it's always enlightening for me, and to hear people's perspectives who are not uh, engaged in this work, or um, and who don't have to be engaged in this work. Although I feel like we all have to be engaged in it, it's always enlightening for me to hear those perspectives because I can use them in when I'm writing or when I'm moving forward. So it's a, it's a valuable piece. Mm -hmm. Although I, you know, I, have, I take issues with, with it, but those are my issues and I take issue with the Tennessee Coates one only because uh, I thought it was uh, W. Du Bois's work again, Souls of Black Folks, where he kind of writes to his son about the lifting of the veil and living through, living, living through the veil. But I understand that everyone's not gonna go back and read Du Bois. So people need current pieces, right, right. you know. Um, so you know, so that all the works have value. So. <coughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Victor. Are you here? Oh, welcome. Come on. Thanks. Um, Victor Nascimento, you're from the the um, HRC. Massachusetts Municipal Association. Oh, and the Human Rights Commission. And the Human Rights Commission. Okay. Right. okay. Well, well, glad to see you, Victor. Uh, <laughs> do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Because we, we just got started, and, and Joyce was telling us a little bit about herself. We were we were just talking about some of her. Sure. Uh, first of all, sorry I'm late. Held up at work. You know how that goes. Um, so I work right now for a governmental nonprofit in Boston, and. Uh, sort of an organization where if you don't work in local government, you likely haven't heard about it. But if you do, you have. And uh, what we do is basically uh, consulting and uh, legislative analytical work uh, as it relates to municipal public policy issues. My role that in particular is I do a lot of technology-driven support, both internally to our organization to some of the communities that we work with. And uh, as many of us there, we all, you know, I do a lot of public policy analysis. And one of my areas of interest, going back to my academic years, is the interaction between racial inequality uh, in particular, but also in the way that that uh, relates to gender inequality and public policy go and government. Because I think one of sort of my care's interest, and I think that a lot of people don't think about it, is governments build bureaucratic processes by which they do things. And sometimes uh, uh, prejudices, racial and, sex and sexist prejudices, get built into the way institutions operate. So that even if you have, get to a point where you have people there who don't believe in that, it still keeps happening because the system was designed in a way that keeps reinforcing those inequalities and issues. 
So that particular interaction is, I think, something that hasn't been looked at enough, and it's one of the things that I'm really interested in. Cool. Thank you. And we had uh, uh, talked about, like, if you could give like a, um, I know we were talking about like us um, talking more about Sandra Bland um, and then also like, so as a larger topic and then also making a personal connection to it. So um, so you, you've given some of the, I want to know if you want to speak a little bit more um, both at either this the personal level or at kind of that macro level. Uh, you can go either way because um, we were talking about, you know, the case of, of women being completely ignored, if not you know, placed in a worse situation. So that's kind of a macro picture. I don't know if you want to go toward, towards like a, a more, um, more personal level or uh, kind of give that kind of experience. And then the same with Victor, to go give a little bit of more back macro of the picture you're talking about. And then you talked a little bit about making that personal connection to the topic. Okay. So you're asking me, I'm going to repeat that to you so I'm, I'm understanding. Yeah. You want a personal experience with me? No, when we had talked in a committee, mm -hmm. right, we had said each person was going to maybe try to do a large macro um, story of the co community-wide, mm -hmm. and then also maybe see if there was making a personal, not necessarily your own experience, but making it more on a kind of a case study, a person level. So trying to make that so that we have these two different um, levels. So oh, either well. one makes sense. You, if you find one to be a better one, mm -hmm. a bit for you. But what I'm taking from the call of your question is, so there's this larger picture of women being silenced, and then there's this smaller, this, you know, the, the thing is, traditionally women are silenced in all of these movements. And so if you narrow that down, it kind of overlaps. And so what he, he says, it becomes institutionalized and further damaged, because that spills over to other things where women of color, because we, these cases we don't hear about, then women individually become, start to feel isolated in their own experiences. So if you've been raped or if you've been uh, any type of oppression, uh, you're likely to speak up and voice those or be empowered because this is a system now for you. This is a system. This system of oppression and um, disambiguation, the taking a part of yourself by society or the disregard of self by society becomes a tradition. So it has a larger damaging effect, especially when it's coming from your own community. So myself as a woman of color, that's a challenge I face every day, is to remain whole throughout the whole day. It doesn't, you know, when I step outside of my house, there's nothing on my face or in my clothing that says, um, you know, I have associates, I have a bachelor's, I have a law degree, I've written three books, I'm a professor. None of that says that about me. So what I can imagine as what, uh, for many women of, women of color, what the burden, what breaks your back, or what Bell Hooks, who writes a lot of feminist theory, black feminist theory, and what Alice Walker has written, who's written black feminist theory, or as we like to say, as women of color, womenist theory, you know, we're excluded largely from the feminist movement, the fourth wave has said deuces. And then we're excluded from this movement, Black Lives Matter, and every other movement. All we know about is Rosa Parks on the bus, and now we get Harriet Tubman on a $10 bill. Thanks. Um, and that doesn't talk about the day-to-day, -day, everyday struggle that makes it increasingly harder for people to even look around this room, for people to be engaged in conversations that will directly affect and benefit them. So I imagine and drawing back, you know, how, when I bring myself into it, so when I say I come out the house and I know who I am, but I'm constantly proving myself, that's very tiring by the end of the day. So I can imagine a woman who doesn't have what I have, even more effort to, you know, yeah. and it's all because it's, it's an, it becomes institutionalized, it becomes an institution, it becomes, you know, I get these emails from, you know, move.org, revolution.org, and stop the revolution of police terror, and I see no women involved, or I don't see, so I'm almost like, you know, and then if you go on social media, it's like, support your king, stand by your black man. So it's almost like, who stands by me, who uplifts me? It's very hard, even when we talk about the prison industrial complex, is you see droves of women going to these prisons to see these African-American men. I'm not saying that's a problem, Who's going to see the black woman behind bars? You understand what I'm saying? You know, we're kind of vilified for 
you know, the black man is lifted up, he's in prison, I go to the welfare office, I'm a welfare hoe. It's a struggle, right? You know, and Cornel West has talked about it. It's still a struggle. But this struggle is somehow, you know, this, this one has been lionized and knighted and put a ribbon on. And, you know, until I open my mouth at, on 3rd Street at Family Probate Court, I'm the defendant. So that's how it, the bigger picture narrows into the smaller picture. It, it's damaging. Uh. Well, sort of, I guess, my, my key thoughts in terms of, of the big pictures, and I think she touched on a couple of really, I think, key issues when you talk about criminal justice. Um, and I think she can speak better about that, that piece of it than I can. The part that I've looked at more, and I think has such a widespread effect that goes on throughout people's lives, is education. So the issue with education in the United States is that right now, when I don't, know, I don't know what the exact figures are for this year since this updates, but at least the last time I, I, I was looking at the figures from a couple of years ago, was estimated that we spend upwards of four times more money educating white kids in this country than we do black kids, and the figures are not much better for Latino kids. And these is in public schools, so we're not talking about spending more money, in private, we're talking about in public schools. And when I tell that to people, they always go, how is that even possible? Uh, are all politicians and people deciding these budgets just racist? And the reality is, a lot of times they're not. But it's about the way that the system was structured in the first place. And so it's the position that it puts people who are in charge of public office. They have a limited amount of money and they're trying to allocate it. So in most of the United States, uh, most of the educational funding will come from uh, property taxes. And so when you live in a community where the properties are worth a lot and the property taxes are really high, the community has a much bigger budget to work with. And because those communities tend to already be more affluent in the first place, um, they already had more money to work with in the first place. So the additional fact that they get a, bunch, a lot of extra funds from the high value of their properties just generally means that you go to some communities uh, like Newton and the public schools are absolutely state-of-the-art. And then you go to some other communities where the property prices are low, their budget already tends to be more strained because those communities tend to be less affluent and they're dealing with more issues that are tied to poverty like higher crime rates. And so their budget is already more squeezed. So you add that to the fact that so much of the educational budget comes from the property tax values and you have local officials sometimes who really, really wish they could put more money in their local schools, and they can't. And so you can talk about changing the minds of people about the fact that you know there is racism and the prejudice uh, and the, and how problematic prejudices are. But if you don't change the very fundamental and pretty straightforward structure of things like how do we fund public schools? you're gonna continue having the same problems. And, and I think that's one of those things that goes unspoken is the fact that the hearts and mind approach is very important. You need to talk to people and there is still a lot of human to human prejudice and assumptions that are made. I can speak from my personal experience as a Latino immigrant that I've had appalling things said to me that had nothing to do with me and that were solely based on ideas people had about what Latino immigrants are. And I think whether you're black or a woman or whatever minority group you belong to, it's always this sort of shock when you are there performing at, as a professional and somebody comes at you with this sort of very personal assumption about you that's deeply rooted in negative prejudices. And all of a sudden you have to deal with that, even though you know, you know it has nothing to do with you. And I think that that is important and something needs to be addressed. But I think also that you can address that all you want and make a lot of progress on it. And if you don't change basic structures about how funding operates and how housing operates and how education operates, you still end up in major institutional inequalities. The other issue that ties into it, a couple of big policy discussions right now as the presidential uh, debate uh, primaries go on is we're talking about things like minimum wage 
which is has gotten to a point where it's basically stopped growing with productivity and inflation and cost of living. And there's a lot of people talking about how we need to increase it. And then you ask the question, well, but minimum wage isn't just a, mi a racial minority problem. Except that as with all these uh, institutional issues, the people who are more, most disenfranchised and most likely to be in poverty are hurt a lot more by it. Mm -hmm. So the minimum wage may not be a black or Latino issue, but it impacts them way more than it impacts a lot of other groups as a percentage in a, uh, uh, of the, the amount, number of the population, right? Uh, as in the, what I mean by that is in the, uh, the percentage of Latinos and blacks who are minimum wage is much higher than the percentage of whites or Asians. And so issues that you earn up front, you say that's not a issue of racial oppression. When you look into it more closely, it is. And because it is relevant that it impacts so much more these disenfranchised groups, because that is just another, another piece, another way in which these groups don't have as much opportunity as other groups. And uh, so, and, and on the government side, which is the other piece that's relevant at the local level and state level and national level, is we still don't have uh, enough minorities being engaged to participate in the government. And it's easy to say, well, anybody can run, just do it. But we know that that's not how it works. You need money to run, you need contacts to run, and you need the know-how of how government works and you need the educational <coughs> background. And we know that all these things are not as easily acceptable to minorities in the US today. And the problem is that if we don't get more minorities in government, uh, it's a lot harder for us to address these inequality issues. Because if you have a politician who comes from a middle or a middle class background and they're a white person, their intentions can be really good but there's a basic human reality that when it's not as personal to you, you generally just don't care as much about it. And there's plenty of exceptions to that. I meet people all the time where there's an exception to that, but when you look at a broader pattern, that is true. And so if you really want people who are personally invested in resolving some of these issues, then you need to have more women in government, and you need to have more black people in government, and you need to have more Latinos in government. And so I think part of <coughs> addressing this, sort of at the root of this, is we need to come up with more ways to get young people engaged in politics and in government and looking forward to that as a plan. Because I think having, knowing a lot of people who've run for office and work in government, you know, you can take somebody who is, you know, 30 something and say, you should run, but if it has nothing to do with their career and they have all their stuff going on, that's not as simple. What I found is some of the people that do have a huge impact on <coughs> government are people who get engaged in it when they're young. And so they're going to direct themselves towards that place. And I think that there's a whole lot of young, passionate people in this community here, in communities all over the, the state, who come from minority communities, who with some good advice and some good mentorship would be really interested and passionate about gearing themselves towards working local or state or, or, or federal level government. And I think that there's a lot more that we could do as a community to <coughs> encourage these young people to do that. So, um, what Victor was really mentioned, that was great, was um, kind of that disenfranchised piece of it. But if we have people who have a lot of things going on and happening to them. They may not feel that the system actually would even work for them. So they might not even lean in to, to even make that network of, of contacts and money and stuff like that. So just thinking about, like, I know you have like such a, a strong experience with a lot of the young adults and, and, and people who have, are trying to you know, make different educational choices and, and with women who are already struggling with equal pay, mm -hmm. you know, and then they have to pay for college and then take on that debt for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And then if they have to lean in because they like, you know, they they need to make some additional choices if I gotta participate and feel the system works for me. Mm -hmm. Is that so much burden that it makes it how um, how can we solve it? Or do you have thought like you know, just just reflecting on that, is that 
Um, um, I always think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So we know at the base of the needs is the need for uh, very basic needs. You need homeostasis, you need, uh, you need to feed your belly. And then the higher need is the very, at the very top is self-actualization. That's where we're asking people to come outside of yourself and join this larger cause. So I'm asking you to go from here to there. That's a long journey, and that takes an extraordinary journey because, you know, I went to law school and lived in a homeless shelter, so it was kind of, you know, I don't expect everyone to have that same, ex you know, experience. So there were many times when I was hungry, but I was still able to visualize this larger picture, and I knew I had to be part of a movement um, because I'm from the old school. I was raised from. My grandmother was born in 1910, very active in the church. Um, my mother was born in 1934. So, um, so the, to answer your multi-layered question, I'll give you a couple of different answers. So first of all, when people are hungry, it's hard to ask them, or when they're struggling, I've worked a minimum wage job all day, I've worked at Dunkin' Donuts, someone has called me welfare B all day, told me my hair was that and my lips were too big. It's very hard for me to come now and sit in and join your movement and hold hands and sing Kumbaya, because it's not going to change tomorrow for me. It's very hard, and it would take an extraordinary person, and there have been extraordinary individuals in all of these movements, all these people are extraordinary, that can lay down and say, it's not going to change tomorrow, it's not going to change next year, it might not ever change in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. So that's a very... So, so that you're asking a lot, first of all, for individuals. You're asking a lot. You're asking a lot of the single mother, of the broke mother, of the poor mother. And this is uh, this is crosses socio and economic or racial lines. You know, it'd be hard. To, you'd be hard pressed to get a <coughs> tired, hungry, broke white woman to come out um, to come out. So I'm not saying that's exclusive to blacks. And none of this, I would speak for my colleague, are we saying that these struggles are exclusive? They're just um, heavier. They always are disproportionately, or disproportionately impacted. So um, I think that it would have to begin almost, as, to engage people, it would have to be, it would have to not start midlife. As I would kind of touch on what he said, you know, to get people involved, it would have to start at a youth level. It has to be, it has to because, you know, that is um, the point where our passions are high and we're not jaded. It's very hard to let go of your childhood dreams, if I might be a poet for a bit there. You know, very much what you dreamt, if you think about <coughs> what you wanted to be at 12 or what incited your passions at 12, they probably still very much incite your passion if you're true with yourself. They still probably make you excited. And that's why when childhood stars die or you see a show on, it it sparks these memories for you because you still have some of that in you. So um, those passions you had as a child, they can flame and blossom and be watered in adulthood. But I don't know so much if they can be um, birthed, you know, if, if, the, if the inception or the impregnation can happen at 40, I think what happens at 40 is maybe there's a pregnancy that you've been carrying from 12 to 40 and then you birth it, now you have the courage, I can't take it anymore. But I don't know if you suddenly get this, this passion from nowhere at 40, you see what I'm saying? So I think it has to be, because that will push you through your nights and your days. You know, me being in a homeless shelter and a single mom and going through what I was going through to get through law school, you know, sometimes, and saying I still have to finish and I want to do this poverty law piece and I want to be a professor. Um, what The 42-year-old didn't get me through that. The 12-year-old Joyce got me through that. The 12-year-old Joyce, who was like, I feel powerless and invisible, got me through what the 42-year-old Joyce needed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I think you have to get people when they're young um, uh, and before they can become so hardened and angry. 
and reject these movements. So it's very important to engage youth. Um, and, and on his, and to overlap on a colleague, what he was saying about uh, engaging more persons of color uh, for the legal piece, um, it's lonely on, on the legal side because uh, recent statistics say 88% of all lawyers in the United States are white, and then 4.8% of those are African American. And then that number, I don't know what the other percentage is. So 88% are white, 4.8% are, are black. And those are men. So I don't know what the percentage of them are black women are. So that also goes back to, you know, when I teach or when I have taught, because I'm not teaching anymore, um, students will tell me, I, I don't want to be a lawyer. I want to be, you know, they want to be anything but engaged in this system. They don't want to learn drafting and acting legislation. It's very hard to impress upon people that we are needed. This, this is the work that is desperately needed um, because who writes legislation? What is, what is Congress but lawyers? Everyone's a lawyer. What has every president been but a lawyer? And how do we change things? We change things through the legislative process. So that uh, the governmental landscape needs to be diversified and the legal landscape needs to be diversified, but we need to catch people young. And um, so whereas, you know, you look at $127,000 debt and you're like, that's a small price to pay for the work I'm going to be doing. So we look at Martin Luther King, he was engaged and had his PhD before 30. That's just a fact. He was dead at uh, 36. So we're getting... We got to snatch them young, and if we look at any movement, who's snatching them young? You know, my grandmother's age. My grandmother was, you know, fifteen or ten. These are conversations that everyone had. You know, when you went to church, you didn't just praise the Lord and do a TD Jakes and you know prosperity. Churches didn't just talk about this is your season. Talk about this is our season. And Cornell West talks about we used to build communities of resistance. We would put together our money and send off one person to Tuskegee, you see what I'm saying, or send off one person to Morehouse to come back to teach the rest of us. So we needed that young person, you see what I'm saying? Then we pool our money again and send, send, send off and get us a thoroughbred marshal. See, we birthed our thoroughbred marshals, you see. We birthed those. Nobody gave them to us. We're not birthing them now. It was a collective, you know, they say it takes a village. That was a black village, and we were building what we needed because we were snatching our youth. So really, now I put the call out to black folk and Latino folk. We have to snatch our youth, because no one's going to snatch them from us. We need to snatch them up. We need to educate them. And I remember being 12 and being in a pre-law camp, and my mother didn't have any money. So for the summer, you know, everybody else, I don't even know how to jump double dutch. I'm a black girl from Philly. I can't jump double dutch. Nor can I ride a bike or play marbles. But I knew what due process was at 12. Because my mother was like, you gonna go off to this camp. And it was in downtown Philadelphia. And I was like, you sucks. I ain't never gonna be a lawyer. And, you know, right? So that's what, you know, I would call the black folks that, you know, if you're watching, you need to be here. You know, you need to, you know, don't watch empire, build empires, you know. Stop this nonsense, you know. Don't watch the reality show. Turn it off and tell your kids to pick up a book. Because I remember telling my grandmother, I'm bored. Well, you can't be too bored. There's books laying around. And you'd be like, oh, okay. So, you know, where is that? Where is that fire? Where is that spirit? Where is the role of the black church? It's not there. And it's not going to be birthed at 40, 45, or 46. It's just not. It can be birthed, but I'm saying you can't. It's my final point. Is, look at it like fertility. It cannot be, I don't think you can get pregnant with it at 40 and 46. Because that egg is old. I think you need to kind of, <laughs> what am I saying? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? You're in menopause now. You don't care. I need to get you while you're fresh and young and fertile. Mm -hmm. You have a question to me on that? No, I just okay. had, I had a later comment. 
Uh, just like in reading the New Jim Crow, I, I think that there's a certain logic to it, like if you especially read the, the last chapters. It like makes me think of you know Flint, Michigan, where they don't really care if the whole population of people gets poisoned to death. Or you see what happened, um, you know, with Hurricane Katrina, where essentially, like, you know, just left left people to die. So I think that there's a certain logic here, and I, I have a feeling that you're going to agree with me on this. But it does it does you know sort of shock people when they first learn about it. And there's, I mean, I, I guess you can't help but say the word genocide. That's that's really the ultimate conclusion. And you look at pretty much like what some of these Republicans are saying. Or, I'm a revolutionary myself. I don't. I don't believe in the Democrats or the Republicans. But I think there there is a kind of a bigger issue on the table here, which is that I think they're looking kind of dire, you know. When, and what happened in Ferguson, where people just exploded, it's kind of like just the tip of the iceberg. And stuff, so. Um. I've always. I kind of stay away from the word genocide because I'm like, oh shit, that means me. Um. And it's a strong word. It's a strong word. It's a real word. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how else you would describe Flint, Michigan, or how you else you would describe Katrina. Um, and those black lives have value. And funny, but the Black Lives Matter movement didn't come up until just now. <laughs> We've always been dying. There's always been an Emmett Till. There's always been this belief that we wouldn't survive. So, you know, I'm, we kind of channel Malcolm X and Booker T. Washington. Now, black folks, you know you're not going to die. So what are you going to do about it? Because to be honest with you, if you know this is what it is for you, what do you want to do about it? And the fact that I don't see any black faces here now, you see, what do you want me to do about myself? Well, I mean, I, I think that there's a sort of a structural thing, too, which is getting back to what this gentleman was talking about, where, you know, when at the at, during the 60s black people were essentially moving north from the south mm -hmm. and they had a huge rebellion that stretched across the whole u.s and places like detroit you know there was a very massive rebellion but people could be kind of absorbed into the jobs there into the mm -hmm. auto industry but that doesn't exist anymore like there aren't any auto jobs to give black youth and they, you know they're, they're considered unruly anyway so we might as well you know just get some immigrants to take those jobs, mm -hmm. you know, even if, but there's, there's a thing where you don't really know what to do with a whole population of people. So, you know, you're kind of in a very volatile situation. It is, and then, then if you, once again, you know, I just, um, I'm a big, I'm not a big fan of Booker T. Washington, but I, I appreciate what he has to say in Up From Slavery, which was written he was a slave himself, so late 1800s he wrote it, founder of Tuskegee. You know, it's kind of the pull yourself up from your bootstraps. If, you, if we know this is what we're faced against, you see what I'm saying? If we know, and I know you have a gun in my head, what then am I going to do? It's almost like Malcolm X said, we have, in Cornell West, this is his battle cry. We have to build our own solutions because I cannot those solutions, and Tennessee Coates touched on this, no one is going to feed me. No one really cares if I live or die as a black woman. You know, I could leave here today and disappear, and I guarantee you I won't be on Nancy Grace. You see what I'm saying? I know that for as much as I've contributed, my life doesn't have as much value in society's view as a, as a white woman, and largely that's institutionalized. That's, that's, that's uh, presumptions about my value. That's presumptions about, um, I don't internalize that presumption. I, I battle it often, but I also just continue to do the work and, and, and would almost plead other individuals of color to get involved in it, to not, you know, um, I just was. I just read something. Uh, there's a website um, on being a black lawyer, and they always post different things. They just post something about another black woman. She just graduated from law school and she was homeless. And I was like, awesome, someone else. And she's like, I can't wait to graduate and go to a large firm. And I'm like, sister, that's not where you're needed. You're needed over here with me, and we share this pack of oodles and noodles and get this work done. 
You see what I'm saying? So, you know, you, you, your belly might not be full, but you're, you're doing the work, you're coming to forums like this, and you're speaking, and you're trying to engage you. The other part of the youth piece is, because they're not getting reinforced in the home, a lot of times the black youth are rejecting you as well. So what I'm saying coming out of my mouth, a black youth will sometimes take it better from someone white. So it's, it's, it's multi-layered. This problem is multi-layered. You know, we say go after the youth and that would seem simple. And then the youth tend to reject you. Then the parent rejects you. And then there you have that tangent of blacks that says she's not down. She don't really know what this is about, you know. Because, you know, not only do you may, you may have whites making presumptions about you. Now that you get to this level of education where I'm at, you know, where I'm at, now you have Blacks making presumptions about you. Oh, you never struggled. You never, you know, she went to law school. I look really good on paper. You know, it's what's behind the paper that's the, the real deal, you know. I'm from Philly. I've seen drive-by shootings. I've been called in the house because they've been ganging on the street, you know. But sitting, I can imagine, you know, at one point sitting where you're sitting, looking at me going, she don't know what this is about, so. I could say diversify, you know, the legal landscape, more people go to law school, and someone right now is saying, well, more black folk go to law school, does she know how much it costs? You know, and he could say more Latinos come into government, You're like, come into government, they trying to build a wall so we can't get, you know? With Trump saying making, uh, make America great again, I, you know, that, even that is like, what do we mean, so? I think, to, to what he said and to what you're saying, and, and this gets a little on the sort of large scale of things, but it's hard to talk about that without getting a, a, a bit on the large scale of things. But, you know, there is a long historical pattern of a lot of people when they're in positions that where they have a lot of power and a lot of money, a lot of influence, where a strategy to keep the masses from saying this is just not fair, we're just going to you know, do something about this, is to keep them fighting for the scraps. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at what happened in places like Michigan and when you're talking about Katrina, you have two examples of cases where there was an ideology in place um, of minimizing uh, the costs and, uh, of the governmental bodies. So there was a purposeful erosion of the capacity of governmental bodies whose job was to oversee these things. And when you look at those issues, uh, you always end up with what Abdita was talking about before, which is when you have the erosion of support structures, it doesn't affect everybody equally, right? It's going to affect the hardest and the harshest that people who have the least means to do it by themselves. And the people who is, it's going to affect nearly not at all are the people who have the resources where they don't need those structures in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so if you are in a position where you don't need those structures, um, it's almost beneficial to you, disregarding of course human compassion, to have a lot more people have so, so little that they're so busy just trying to survive that they don't have the time to understand the governmental structure or to protest or to go to college or to do all the things that they would need to do so that they could contest that power structure. You want them to have the bare minimum because it keeps them from having the time and the energy and the resources to stand up to you. Now that, that sounds like I'm saying, oh, there's this big conspiracy. Of course, when you break it down, it's like I said, it's not that purposeful it's an aggregate of selfish actions and racisms and institutional policies left over by racist and, and, and classist policies. It's the accumulation of all of that that creates that on a grand scale. Wait. But nevertheless, it's the case. You don't think it's, I mean, it seems like there's evidence that there's still strategic generation of these structures now. I mean, if you look at the voter ID laws and stuff like that, the only rationalization for them is Oppression, I mean, or just enfranchisement, and it seems like there are other, like it seems like there are there are parties that are actively trying to shape government to deliberately achieve ends, exactly the ends that you describe. No, no, I don't disagree with you. I, I didn't mean to say that there is none of that. 
I mean, to say well, that... We, we have a huge heritage. Right. Yeah. That's a combination of things, yeah. right? You're absolutely right. Some of the, I mean, we just recently had, I forgot his name right now, but uh, it's... It, it should be a, an easy Google search if anybody is interested. But one of the sort of uh, big policy uh, people from the Reagan administration came out recently and basically oh, yeah. said, he said, yeah, I heard that. he said, oh yeah, the war on drugs was a systematic and purposeful attempt at getting a lot of black people in jail because we wanted to get them off the streets and we know, and once you throw them in jail, they don't vote anymore. And it was the sort of thing where it's like, you can look at it and you can say, maybe, right, before this guy said that, I would look at that and I would say, the consequences of it have been far more harsh on the black community. But maybe that's not what they meant by it. Maybe it was more of a classist issue. Maybe they wanted to go, you know, to persecute poor people. But when the guy comes out and says it, yeah. then there's really no doubt anymore. Well, in law, we call that incidental consequences. So we just say, you know, if we're trying to redress an issue, we say that's an incidental consequence and that's not, and so that's how we, but to speak to what you're saying, certain systems are set up um, and to agree with you to keep us out. For instance, there's no mistake that there's only 4.8% black lawyers. What I didn't add to that is that the American Bar Association was set up specifically to keep women, Jews, and blacks out. That was the original purpose of the ABA. The ABA is still in charge of um, your bar, the, administering the bar, you getting into law school, the LSAT, the, they are the big brother in the sky. So, if you're a black person to even get through the doors of the law school, A, is your first miracle. Your second miracle is to stay there. Because I've seen questions that will say, he hits the ball off into the rough. This is a bar exam. What is the rough? I guess it's when you golf. So it's set up so that, you know, if you do get this far, the last thing we want you to do is to swear in, because then you'll be able to address this. So now, we hopefully, we can lure you into this big firm litigation piece, and you don't come and assist. So you know, at a certain point, I guess the realization of these systems, and I kind of always kind of heard about the war on drugs kind of being a conspiracy thing. It was something that was always said in the black community, but you were kind of always like, eh, not really. It can't really be. It wasn't, you know, I'm, I've never been a, a conspiracy, what do you call it, conspiracy theorist? Yeah. yeah, I've never been one of those people. I kind of never thought there was someone else on, on, on the noly grass. Mm -hmm. I never thought that. <laughs> I'd probably be so, proven wrong. <laughs> so yeah, so Victor, what you were talking about, and you were mentioning too, and that is like set up, but I come from India originally, and I'm used to a caste system. And that's kind of set up. It's so much in the minds of people that even though there's a change and it is kind of government is saying no caste, this, that, but it is there that the, there is an operation in, in a way of, you know, kind of, as you say, in the higher and lower in the hierarchy. I mean, here it is a little bit different. Well, you know, you've ever heard the saying. Um, I mean, New Jim Crow mentions, uh, she mentions that the caste system and the, that. The caste system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, then after a while, you don't have to oppress the people anymore. They'll it do it for there. themselves. It's so, you know, you ever put fleas in a jar, and then you, it just, you hold your hand over yeah. it, and then after a while, they'll stop trying to jump out. So then we look at our urban areas. So then if I hold my hand over the jar for so long, you're going to stop trying to jump out. And you're not going to jump out to MIT. You're not going to jump out to Harvard. You're going to just jump out to a job. And That's I'm... Impression. And I'll be glad that you cash your paycheck and you don't invest it in the community you live in. The, the black dollar never sees the black community again. So that's awesome, right? Now, I, now you're hooked on these consumer goods that you, you can't afford, but they make you feel better, right? So I'm gonna get this BMW and this, that, so I can feel better in my hood, but it's, it's like further digging yourself down in the hole. Uh, at a, a Boston event, one of the neighbors brought up the fact that they used to have what's common in a lot of different countries, but they had it in the Boston area where um, black community members po pooled their money. Mm -hmm. And then individually one person could take out from the pool and then purchase land, 
purchase storefront, purchase things, and they're able to show neighborhoods that those people who participated in that are doing really well. They own lots of property now. But that was because they utilized the collective of their community. Well, that was so a southern like, thing. Southerners, you know, you know, as we, you know, if you've ever read the book, The Warmth of or Seeking Other Sun. of the Suns, you know, like I'm, I'm a descendant of Southern folks. You know, I, you know, my folks came up from Middleton, Virginia, to Philadelphia, which some people might argue is still kind of country south, but big city um and uh that that was a southern thing you know you would you you know everyone pitched in to get someone what i was saying before we all pitched in to send one person to school but i think uh what's happened is that collective has been lost in this fray because we're struggling to meet these basic needs so it becomes very individualized we're no longer connected in the struggle we're individualizing the struggle so what is it together we stand divided we Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one. So you know, we we got here together. We got we got here together. We marched together, and then we just kind of did this. So we were like this, and now we're like this. So the answer is, how do we become like this? How do we? Because we need to be like this. You know, remember when you were little, people in the church and the steeple open it up. There are the people. Um, we have to be like that in some way and engage folks. To and these I, conversations, yeah. And I think that's interesting to say that because, and, and, uh, and to Sonia's question, because I think that ties into a lot of what we were talking about before. I think it's, I mean, it's definitely a really great achievement when small communities can get together and pool their resources and do things in a cooperative way. But part of why, over time, societies have developed these larger centralized governments is because those things work on a small scale, but they don't work on a large scale, mm -hmm. right? Once you start adding more and more people, it just becomes, you need professional people just to administrate the, the resources in the first place, because otherwise it gets abused. So the larger you get, the more of a structure you need. And that was the reason why we developed government in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem right now, when you look at the US uh, is, and when you look at the issues that we were talking about is, um, when you have a government that doesn't work, that doesn't affect everybody equally. For the people at the top, if, it's, if anything, it's better. Because if the government doesn't work, the government doesn't get in the way, right? And there's a reason why the ideas about deregulation, small government, you know, uh, lower taxes, that the, these things are not coming from the masses. These ideas come from the top down mm -hmm. because that's who it works for. So I think part of accomplishing that on a large scale that can really kind of make move the country forward and that helps minorities but ultimately helps everybody who isn't rich is that we need our government to work better. And our government has never worked very well for minorities. So it's not like at one point the government was great and now it isn't. At one point the government was better for the white middle class. It's gotten worse for the white middle class and it's continued to be really bad for minorities. But that doesn't mean that it can't be improved. And I do think that you know, while there are a lot of factors in place, one thing that I'll kind of put through because I do think it relates to a lot of things is, is that idea that if we really want to lift up minorities, we need better government. Mm -hmm. Government is that pool. Government is that place where you can get a lot of resources from a lot of people and then lift up the people who are really at the bottom. And there are ideas floating around, there are movements floating around that are talking about things like tuition-free state schools. The impact that that would have on communities of color is immense. We're talking about things like raising the minimum wage so that it's proportionate to production and inflation level. That would have a massive impact to minority communities. It happens to also help American workers in general. But I do think that it's this idea that it is, I think, a really big and I think sometimes unreasonable expectation to say, you are poor, you were you know, beaten up on a metaphorical level and sometimes on a not metaphorical level, depending on, on your encounters with the police. And you have all these things going on in your life. By the way, I also need you to be a political activist. 
I also need you to somehow make it to law school so that you can run for office. That is a lot to ask for people who are at the bottom of the run. So I think regardless of what your ethnic background is or how wealthy or not you are, because I do also meet people who are very wealthy and still agree with this because they, they understand it at a human level instead of just looking at how can I make more money, is that we need better government. Because through better government and providing better access to basic fundamental things like better public schools and then access to good quality state universities that are tuition free with the right support for people to get through that is when you can actually start moving people who are all the way at the bottom to a place where it won't fix everything but at least things are good enough going down to the hierarchy of needs where if you at least have access to affordable housing and good food and good public schools, you can now start thinking higher than yeah. that. But as long as you're pushed at the bottom where all that you have time and energy to think about is, mm -hmm. how am I gonna put food on the table? Where am I gonna live? You, oh, you know, I'm gonna send my kids to college with what money? As long as you keep so much of the population there, mm -hmm. they can't become part of fixing the system. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I know I'm repeating myself, but this is, I think, I, a really, really big thing that's being argued about right now and that I think a lot of people don't understand is, I do think before, this is a long process, mm -hmm. and before you can get to the stage where minorities mm -hmm. can really start improving the government, we just need to make the government work in the first place and lift up people who are living at that extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. And anybody that tells you that we can't do that is lying. Mm -hmm. And this is something I tell people, oh, we can't afford it. Sure we can't. We've afforded how many trillions of dollars in, 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 in wars that didn't make the regions more safer or more stable. We spend money on a whole lot of things. Mm -hmm. And we have we are leveraging our resources off technology. The reason why productivity has nearly doubled in the past few decades is because technology makes resources more efficient. And so you have to ask yourself the question, the question as our productivity increases, as our efficiency increases, our technology increases, why do I still hear, oh, we can't afford to give everybody those basic resources and services? Mm -hmm. Or that is too high. It is just not true. Mm -hmm. We can't afford it, and we can't do it, and until we do it, I feel like we're going to be stuck in cycles of oppression. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> no, I was just, I was just looking at it. Looking at me? Yeah. Right? That, that is right. That is correct. I, um, I, I wasn't trying to, I was just being honest. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, not to repeat it, but I, I've always gone back, even when I teach my students, you know, I guess my final point is I always go back to the hierarchy of needs because, you know, it's a, like I said, it's a long journey. At the very bottom is the basic needs have to be met. And then there's uh, self-esteem and then there's love. It's very hard to have, so you have this very basic, before you can even love yourself, your belly has to be full, you know, because you, you know, so you're really telling people, and these are the people that we want to reach, we want to engage, and you're telling someone that is really has nothing, and you're just stark poverty, come out and be engaged in this movement. So, you know, it may sound like one point I'm being hypocritical because I'm saying the onus is upon us. I'm saying, not an easy answer. I'm saying somehow there has to be that um, that impetus, that that blossoming, that that um, that uh, transcendency of spirit to transcend those circumstances. Because my God, my ancestry does not come from people whose bellies were full. You know, when we think of who came out of slavery, nobody's belly was full. You know, most journeys on the Underground Railroad, those were not full bellies. Those were hungry folks that found a way. You know what I'm saying? I would say almost found a way to me, right? You know. Um, Same as striking workers. 
workers that are striking. They're hungry. Because they're hungry. So we have to, I don't know what that spirit was and what that was and if that can be examined, but that has to be revisited. And that's important, but, you know, once again, it is government, it's, it's, it's access, because that's a word we haven't said, it's about access. Um, how does someone even get to me? Like, how does someone who has nothing get to me to hear what I just said? How do you get to me? Because maybe I'm assuming that there are no folks of color here because they are, don't want to come, or too tired, or maybe it's just a simple matter of, you don't have the money to get on the 88 to get here, you know? And when I just saw something uh, Wednesday, there was um, a, a rally on the 14th. It was a rally at the State House the, for the $15 minimum wage. They had it on Wednesday, though, at 1 o'clock. So who do you? Wednesday at 1 o'clock? Who do you want to come to that lobby? Just like the the people that want to stop the terror on police, want people to go to New York on a Saturday to rally. Now it's necessary work, but you're asking me to tell you to take off work at Papa Gino's, Dunkin' Donuts, Panera, by the way, I've worked at all of them, on Saturday, right? So I know the struggle. You're asking me to take off Go to New York, get on a bus, it's going to cost me $50, possibly risk being arrested. Now I have to come back for civil litigation or criminal charges in New York. You're asking me to do that. We're asking a lot of people, but at the same time, I'm saying I'm asking a lot of you, it'll pay off. But I don't know how we example that. I don't know, you know, if I'm a good example and you both said lovely things not to minimize it or mm -hmm. to be facetious, but I don't, you know, this, this is a cycle and this is a conversation that's been had many times and it'll be had many times again. You know, you were bringing up why people, there are more people of color here and I think that discussion came up in one of our discussions and I'm just wondering if, if it's because, or one of the reasons could be that, you know, people of color live this. I mean, this is your life, this is people of color's life. They don't want to come here and discuss this necessarily. It's, it's, it's something that they live every day. So is this not going to give them anything? You know, are um, we not offering something in these discussions? And how do we then do that? How do you offer something? that might entice people to want to do that. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't, see, first of all, I think these discussions are happening. I see them happening in people's homes. I see them on black people chat, on, you know, I see these discussions happening. Um, so they're not happening. They're not, not, not happening. Does well, that make sense? Yeah. Um, they yeah. are happening. Um, I think it's hard to get people to come. I don't think necessarily, I, and I'm not, the national spokesperson for people of color. Um, but I'll, I'll just take a stab at it. Um, just a minute. It's hard to get people out once again when we, we're talking about people um, that are already dealing with so much. And it's almost, it's, I see it as a trust issue. You want me to come sit in some rural library with a bunch of folks that are, are the majority and say this, say what they should already know because then there's always this thing where Alice Walker said I shouldn't have to educate you on my oppression. You know damn well what it is, you know, and how is this going to change Friday? So it's, you know, you've kind of answered your own question. Like, you know, folks of colors are having this conversation, but coming here, how is this going to change Friday? How is this going to change the summer of police not stopping me on some BS? How is this going to change that I'll get a higher prison sentence for having, you know, this much crack as opposed to, you know, this much cocaine. How, what is that going to change? Tell me what's this going to change and I'm going to come out. You know, you know, if maybe if the mayor was sitting here next to me, you get folks out, right? Well, who's going to come out for Joyce Angela Jellison, and JD and, and Victor? I mean, it's just, I don't know. <laughs> I was just, I was just, you know, yeah. you're gonna, you know, what, what's gonna change? You know, you're gonna ask me, gonna come to Corbridge, and oh no, I can't. I mean, I, 
you know, people want change, and unfortunately, we've moved past the days where people were willing to wait for it and walk to work and do everything that our grandmothers and grandfathers did. They want it and they want it now. Unfortunately, that's for everyone. We want instant gratification. People want to drive through like McDonald's and order their civil rights and have them right there. Just like, you know, I'll take some. I'll take some due process and a side of fries. And that's just not how it works. It's really the legislative process is slow and tedious. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I, I can't help but think of like, you know, the recent case in, in Brooklyn where this guy, uh, a guy girl, he was shot in his stair, stairwell. And uh, just recently they let the cop go. It's like basically they, you know, not even manslaughter charges on, on this police officer. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it gets back into this question of government, which is, you know, of course there are decent and good people in government, right? I mean, some of my neighbors, <laughs> I live in Cambridge, are people who, you know, in, in government. But I think, like, the question is kind of like, well, what's the essence of what this is really about? Because it, if you look at what the U.S. does around the world, or you look at really, like, the structure of oppression here in the United States, what you see is the courts, you see the prisons, you see these murdering police officers. You see, you know, the Obama administration using drones, killing. And, and what's interesting is that they don't just do it themselves. They also give it to their partners, right? Like Saudi Arabia uses the drones on some other whole country. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm, I'm not, I'm just saying that there's, there is a sort of a deeper question of, well, what is the essence of these things? And how can we work together to, you know, bring more people to kind of understand that. Well, I, I think sort of two things I would say to that is, I think one piece is, uh, which is at a very basic level, is information matters. And it matters in the sense that there are difficult conversations to be had that a lot of people don't want to have. There's a lot of misinformation being spread out by purposeful, purposeful actors that want to misinform because they are hiding something. They're hiding something for someone. So at a micro level, you know, it is about people having the courage to talk to their neighbors and their friends and the people they know in their community about what they see is going on that they might not know about that they should be worried about. And I think social media and the internet are actually something that's really helping that. I know for a lot of people my age, uh, a lot of these primaries are being followed through alternative uh, forms of news and uh, social media, where there's a lot of things being said that are true and should be said, but you would never see in a corporate news media network. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of, you know, there are more tools available now that enable people to communicate and get out information, start conversations. And I think we're just touching, you know, seeing the tip of the iceberg, uh, iceberg of the impact that that's going to have for years to come. Because for a long time in our sort of, you know, it was just a limitation where if you wanted to reach a lot of people, you had to be in a position of power to do so. Mm -hmm. That's not so much the case anymore. Uh, you know, in fact, I personally know people who have who are making YouTube videos and talking about social justice issues were having like a couple hundred thousand people watch them. So, you know, I think that that paradigm is shifting and I think young people are going to push and lead into that paradigm. And I think the other piece of it too is, you know, we're talking about the fundamentals and then you, you, you talk about voting and you talk about young people understanding the importance of voting and of how their government works. So I've talked to, for example, you know, you got a lot of people, or kids in high school, and you say to them, you know, do you know what the school committee is? They're like, the what? <laughs> right? So these are kids who are in a school, and there's an elected committee of people who live in their community, making a lot of decisions that impact their school. A lot of kids don't even know what it is. And I think that's the kind of thing, and that's what I mean by having conversations, that you can approach people, and you can go in and say, you know, you should know what this is. Let me tell you about what it is. Also, while I'm at it, let me tell you about when they meet. And let me tell you that actually, you can just kind of come in and look at them talking and it's right outside of school. And it's the power of information that I've seen many times, you know, working that sometimes when people, sometimes information is the tool that people need to do something. And I think the piece on the voting is really crucial. You know, we have a, you know, just 
uh, embarrassing voting system in this country. Voting is hard for some reason. Voting is particularly hard if you're a working class person who can't take time off. And these aren't things that are complicated to fix. For example, why isn't major voting days holidays, mandatory holidays, where you have to give your place? Why not? We're talking about a day a year, or in the case, let's say, the presidential election, you're talking about a day every four years. Why isn't that a holiday? There are very straightforward things that can be done if people are loud enough about it that can start opening up opportunities for people to have more impact. If voting is easier, more people will do it. And if more people will do it, it's harder to manipulate the results. Mm -hmm. The smaller your voting audience, the easier it is for you to target them, inform them, and, sh and make them vote your way. But as you increase the voting pool, that gets a lot harder. And you know, there has been a very purposeful, like uh, when that gentleman over there was talking about, effort to get less people to vote. Mm -hmm. And that, that is purposeful. That is not an accident. Getting less people to vote has been the agenda of people who want to maintain the status quo and the political power for a very, very long time. It is absolutely intentional. And there is a lot that we can do about that. That is the kind of thing that I wish people would protest and get a lot louder about. Mm -hmm. And there's other things too. You know, why is every state running their own set of 20 crazy rules about how their primaries are conducted? Mm -hmm. Right? It's like a puzzle. I study politics, and if you pick out a random state and, tell, and ask me, how are their primaries? I couldn't tell you. Because every one of them has so many random rules about how it works, and that makes it harder for people to participate, because you need to understand how the primary works. You need to understand when you need to register by, you need to understand who can and can vote in it. And then there's other things too, you know, like independence right now in New York City for the Democratic primary. Mm -hmm. Three million independents in the state of New York, because independents are now the largest voting bloc in the country. They make up 42% because too many people have been unhappy with party politics on both sides and they have just left. So at this point, 42% of registered voters are independents. But most states then allow them to vote in the primaries. So whatever candidate you end up with at the end there is certainly not the candidate that was picked by the voters. It was the candidate that was picked by a fraction of a fraction of the voters. And so, you know, I think before I get too long-winded on this, the, the sort of short on that is, none of these things are easy. I'm not saying, oh, let's just fix all this. But I am saying that if you want to start fixing it, start with the fundamentals. And one of the fundamentals is voting needs to be a lot easier, and, it needs, and primary voting needs to be open to independence. You do that, and you, you, you start it out. Good idea. How can we mobilize that? I was going to add that I think it's very important that we speak to the right audience as well. Um, we should speak with people in government who make these decisions, pass those policies, like the legislative body. We should, in a community, begin and have those discussions with our elected officials, and we should educate them on what's happening in their community. And we should take the opportunity to vote and follow each person's policies because each one of us can make a change, whether or not we realize it or not. You know, we all still have equal opportunities, and we still have due process. You know, and we still have, you know, goals and ambitions that we can have elected officials accomplish on the masses as well. You know, for the whole body. You know, of people out there. Yeah. But the more we stay secluded, we don't get involved, and the more we don't vote, um, then this is what happens: we continue that repeated cycle over and over. Yeah. <coughs> I just wanted to thank you both. I know that um, we, we uh, had you come up to talk to us after we had three books and uh, and try to process what's been happening, you know, in the, the wide scale and see what we can talk about. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for, for giving us your time and um, lots to consume. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.